Hey, it's very exciting stuff. We got lots of room in here. You could have all come down. Next time. <laughs> all right. If everybody is okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order and get a certification of quorum, please. All right. Yes, Chair White, we have more than 50% of the members present. All right. Thank you. So I have a few notes here. And the first one is technology. So just bear with me, please. And I think you've probably all got it figured out, but I'm going to read through this anyway. Welcome to the first hybrid meeting of the GRCA board. Please keep in mind the following. Virtual members will be automatically muted upon entry to the meeting to avoid background noise. In-person members do not require screens and do not need to log in to the meeting. However, if using a laptop or device to view the agenda, please ensure all sound is turned off from your device. Members attending both virtually and in person should physically raise their hand when the chair calls for a recommendation to be moved, seconded, and when in favor or when opposed, as this will allow the viewers and staff to see the vote. If members have questions regarding a report or would like to speak, virtual members should use the raise hand function and in-person members should press the button on their microphone. Please be patient as we work out the most effective way to order speakers and between virtual and in-person attendees. So I guess the, the rule of thumb today is gonna be that we're gonna see how this goes. So if there's somebody online or somebody that I'm not seeing, just speak up. Let me know you, you need to, you'd like to intervene because if I can't see, I'm not, I'm just gonna, you know how slow I go. So um, just let me know if you'd like to, we'll, we'll keep this relatively informal today, except for Bruce Whale. He doesn't get, can we have him turned off? Okay. All right. Um, so 2022 municipal elections. Congratulations to everyone for running in this election and in the past and to those retiring from public service. I would like to personally thank each and every member for a great four years on this board. Your work here has been very much appreciated. And I know some of you have some great things you're doing in the future and some are hanging around and it's, these things are always, this has been a very strange election and uh, been a lot of changes. So thank you for all the work you've done here over the years. I know the community appreciates it. All right. Okay, this board has seen the organization through new leadership, new legislation and regulations and a global pandemic. It's been a busy four years. We hope to see many of the same faces returning, but we do understand that change is sometimes necessary to help pave the way forward. As the GRCA works through the transition plan and towards compliance with new regulations, this board should feel confident that staff are ready to move forward and continue their work in improving the health of the Grand River watershed for its residents. For any members who may not be returning to the board after this meeting on behalf of the GRC staff, you are sincerely appreciated and wish the best in your future path. So with that, we shall press on to the, oh, no, I've got, they, they gave me pages and pages this time. You've been saving it up. Okay, with the incoming board, a half day orientation session will be scheduled on Friday, January 20th. Returning members will be encouraged to attend and uh, we'll probably send out calendar invites and we'll see if that date works and see if we've got quorum by then. There's a lot of moving parts right now. So we're just gonna try to mosey along as, as best we can and move things around. There'll be some flexibility in there. Back to old business. On Monday, September 26th, Samantha and I attended Conservation Ontario Council. Agenda topics included ongoing regulatory requirements as well as the 2023 proposed Conservation Ontario work plan and budget. On October 25th, the government released more homes Build Faster, Ontario's Housing Supply Action Plan 2022-23. Along with the plan, the government introduced Bill 23, the More Homes Built Faster Act 2022, and is seeking feedback on the changes proposed under the legislation. Samantha will have more on this later in the meeting. All right, so there's the note. So thank you, everyone. So we'll move right into the formal part of the meeting. I have a motion that the agenda for the general membership meeting be approved as circulated, as amended. There, there's an amendment coming up. Moved by John, seconded by Joe. Uh, I guess all in favor, go back to that. That is carried, thank you very much. No, uh, is there any declaration of pecuniary interest? Hearing and seeing none, minutes of the previous minute, motions that the minutes of the general membership meeting held on September 23rd, 2022 be approved as circulated. Moved by Bernie, seconded by Ian. 
All in favor? Carried, thank you. Nothing arising. So we have correspondence there. A motion that correspondence from the Canadian Society of Soil Science regarding their successful bid for the 24th World Congress of, Congress of Soil Science be received as information. Moved by Richard, seconded by Jerry. All in favor? That is carried. I'm not going to have to see my chiropractor after this. All right. So moving right along to first and uh, that's not required. So we have one, as you know, Bill 23 was announced and they want us to provide comments yesterday. So Sam's going to give us a little verbal update on that and see where we go. So Sam, turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. So I'm sure uh, many of you are also um, hearing from your municipal staff with the number of changes and the number of ERO postings that the province has posted in response of Bill 23. There are some impacts to the Conservation Authorities Act and changes. Um, <clears throat> and staff are currently working our way through the number of the changes that are being made. Some to highlight is GRCA's role in the planning process, um, the possibility of freezing fees, we're thinking that it's more related to um, development. So our permitting and planning fees, although it's not clear in the, the legislate, the proposed legislation or the associated guiding documents. Um, and in terms of some of that as well, there, the deadlines for comments to um, be submitted to the ERO are November 24th, which is actually the day before our next board meeting um, and December 30th. Some of the more critical ones are due um, November 24th. So we're asking the board um, if it's possible to pass a motion to allow us to meet with the ad hoc CA Act Regulations Committee to get approval of the comments before submitting them um, to the ERO. And we will obviously bring back those comments to the board as well, but just with the timing, um, we won't be able to have a board meeting before we're able to submit those comments. Sue? Um, so through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Vice Chair Foxen is suggesting that um, if anybody has comments um, on any of the bills that affect the Conservation Authorities Act, that they could email me directly in terms of their comments. Um, yes, we could send out a, a draft to the entire board before we submit it. Um, our, our hope is that we can meet with the ad hoc committee before November 15th when appointments expire for the GRCA board. Um, and at that time, we could circulate a, a draft copy to all the board members as well. Yeah, so we're dealing with a tight timeline here. We're not sure we're going to have quorum by the with, with the people getting appointed and municipalities not meeting and all those things in play. But they've put us in a box, right? They've given us, this is a very significant piece of legislation for us. So I think the general thought here is we'll have an ad hoc meeting. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to depend on staff to get some comments in. And ultimately, they would have produced the original comments anyway. So we're looking, what's the motion we want today to delegate to staff? Do we have a, 
Yep. Do you have Chair, one? Chair White, uh, that the CA Act Regulations Committee be authorized to submit comments on Bill 23 on behalf of the GRCA general membership. So basically staff will put something together. We'll have an ad hoc meeting, committee meeting, and that committee will then suggest those comments and they'll be sent forward. And then of course the board will get a copy of all that all done. So move, I'll get a move by Sue, seconded by Guy. Uh, all in favor? I, I, sorry, were there any other comments or questions on that? Is everybody comfortable here? Richard, go ahead. Yes, could we get a copy of Bill 23 sent to us then, please, thank you. Okay, anything further? So that's motions carried then, good? All right, thank you. Okay, so back to the, um, and that's the amended agenda partially, that's why the agenda was. Okay, so do you wanna test again? You're, this isn't snack time. Okay, you all. Uh, well, Sonia's got to give up. Going to get so let's. I've lost sound. I don't seem yeah. to have any sound. Us virtual folks can't hear anything. Yeah. The sound system has been reset. There'll just be a slight delay. Okay, it's on now. Test. Can, the, Ooh. Can, the virtual, <laughs> can the virtual people hear me? Yes. It's quite loud. Hello, test, test. Can you folks out there? Well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can hear. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we, yes, we can. You. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your patience on this. We're getting there. So we're going to move on to the next agenda item, if that's all right. We've got um, the uh, budget draft. Sonia, you got a presentation you want to? Well, there it is. I'll just turn the floor over to you, if that's all right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to try not to stand too close to the mic. Uh, so this is a review of our first draft of our budget for this year, which we deferred a little bit to try to gain greater insight into how things the landscape is looking. And in terms of our budget challenges, they look very different from the last couple of years where our main challenges were just trying to get through COVID and how to deal with the uncertainty around the regulations. There's a lot more certainty around those regulations. And so it's really shifted now. And what we're currently dealing with is really the, uh, the biggest thing is the current economic inflationary pressures. And because we have knowledge about uh, new regulations, we have uh, been able to tackle some restructuring and we've also had some senior uh, staff retirements as well to help us uh, navigate through uh, where we are heading in terms of our structure. Uh, we're also experiencing in the last few years, you know, significant annual growth in our conservation area revenues. And that sort of forces us to also look at uh, you know, what is the uh, appropriate staffing structure that we need to manage that, that volume. And of course, we're dealing with infrastructure costs that are also impacted by things like supply chain issues. And um, we also are having to consider how we're moving forward with the environmental education program given the new regulations. I'm gonna speak to each of these a little bit more in turn. So in terms of the, how the inflationary pressures are impacting us, we are noticing ex very significant increases on our insurance expense. Certainly feel there's going to be pressure on wages and benefits. 
Our collective agreement expired uh, at, at the end of 2021, and we do not have a collective agreement yet for 2022 or obviously for future years. And the this inflation and, and supply chain issues are having a significant impact on some of our capital type spending. In terms of uh, staffing considerations, uh, we've done some realignments and we've spoken to these a bit in the past couple months with the board. We added a permanent engineering position. We're gonna fund that out of the new water management operating reserve that we established. Uh, this is permanent, so it's not a sustainable solution to fund a position from uh, a reserve. So we will be planning over the next few years how that salary has to be incorporated. So we're gonna transition it in. We're not gonna say by next year we have to get it all, but over the next uh, two to three years, we'd hope that it be built into the operating bu budget. Uh, we have a temporary land management analyst position that's being driven by the requirements under the new regulations. And we will fund that with the transition reserve that we've been able to establish over the last couple of years. And we've added a permanent IT position and we're funding that by increasing admin costs. But we also have our admin costs that have been declining that we've noticed a trend over uh, COVID and whatnot to offset that increase. As I mentioned, our conservation areas are growing. Uh, this draft budget it does achieve a break-even result for that program area, uh, but a reminder that we don't allocate any corporate overhead costs currently in the, in the program area. The revenue assumption is, is still very conservative at 10 million. We budgeted last year's actual was 9.5 million. We're looking even to come in at 11 million this year. I think we just surpassed it. So um, we, we are being conservative, but if this trend continues, uh, don't know if it'll flatten out. Other concept, other CAs have indicated to us that they found their revenues flattening somewhat after COVID, but we didn't experience that. So maybe it's a delayed thing. So we are being very conservative still. Uh, we increased our operating expenses to offset the increased revenue expectation. Um, there's no ability in this current budget to set aside money to the reserves. We will use 1.5 million of the, the operating uh, revenue to fund capital expenses, but the capital budget is in fact $2 million. So we will fund the difference by going to the conservation area reserve. So overall we're budgeting that the conservation area reserve will decline in 2023. So again, just in general certainties are always around revenue as it relates to this type of activity. And as I've mentioned, you know, infrastructure costs and some of the quote prices we're seeing um, in the, in the current economic environment are typically much higher than what we would have expected. In terms of the environmental education program, uh, we've got a very conservative estimates in the, the first draft of the budget. We will assume our school contracts are in place. They are negotiated till June, 2023. So they'd be negotiated based on their school year. So another contract will be, have to be negotiated for next September. We've assumed a continued assumption that the day camps uh, will not proceed in 2023. And the community programs, they are very limited. We didn't budget an amount. Um, even when they were full steam, they were still maybe 15, 20,000. And, and we might have a little bit of activity there, but nothing uh, substantive. And this in the 2023 budget, we're not under the new regulations yet. So we continue to rely on municipal general levy. Uh, for for the program. And the challenge will be what should be an appropriate business model under the new regulations. The environmental education is considered a category three program, which means uh, we, it's, there's no mandatory general levy that can be applied to this program. We want to really look at the feasibility of running our day camps and our community programs. And a reminder that the school year does start in September 2023 again. And we really will be looking to uh, have a business model that contemplates the new regulations and the, the reduced funding of levy, eliminated funding of levy. So if there's anything substantive that arises, we can adjust, adjust future drafts before February. That um, shared talk speaks to our challenges. Now I just have to, when I list the just general major assumptions in the budget, we assuming that our compensation and benefit 
uh, it costs will increase by 4%. That allows for some rate increase, grid movements and benefits. We've also got three FTEs in this budget that I mentioned on the previous slide. We've got also bumped up the budget for students given the added revenue. And we can't lose sight of the fact that um, OMER's rules changed and commencing in 2023, uh, other than continuous full-time employees are allowed to opt in and are eligible for OMERS. So our students will be eligible for OMERS. So we did put in a, an additional provision for a salary costs in the parks related to this, this matter, but it'll be interesting to see how that, how many students actually choose to opt in. For this strap, I've held property taxes constant because we've sort of have a little bit of play in there and what we have in the budget historically. Um, our insurance expenses I mentioned is it was a very substantive increase. We held overall the administrative costs were held constant, but that included a, one area of admin spent, expenses, namely IT that I mentioned earlier, where we had to increase the expenses charged to all the programs given a staffing increase, but that is being offset by seeing a trend in decreasing costs for travel and also some great savings as relates to our communications costs that we're realizing, leveraging new technology, et cetera. Um, our operating costs right now, I'm just holding them constant, are increased. We've, of course, uh, the operating park activity, we increased by 700,000 because of the activity. And there were in the, the prior year's budget, a lot of, and we have, we'll see this at the end of, the, when we finalize this budget, uh, expenses that are one time and they're things that we were able to inc incorporate into the budget because we had a surplus and they're not expenses we relied on and we reversed them out when we begin the 2023 budget exercise and that was over 400,000 that uh, shows as a reduction to expenses between the two years. So overall our operating expenses are increasing by about 1.2 million or 4.5%. Uh, this chart here serves to highlight the total budget size for 2023, which is coming in at 23.3 million at this point, which is a, a million and a half less than last year. But this serves to show you that, yes, our operating budget is increasing, as I mentioned, by almost 1.2 million or 4.5%. But at present, the capital and special, special projects project are substantially lower than last year. And this is typically at this exercise at this stage of the game, a timing exercise. Uh, these budgets get revised and our special projects get revised um, as, we, as we formalize how much needs to go into the next budget. Because a lot of these projects spill over two years and you see where they're coming in at and whatever you don't spend, you spill over into the next year. So uh, I, I expect this figure will, I know this figure will increase. <laughs> Um, uh, just to highlight that our operating budget is really maintaining the, all our programs as, as they exist in 2022, and just showing the, generally what they break down into, that our capital budget of about 4 million relates to primarily our water control structures, our conservation areas, and some water equipment. And in terms of the the water management capital, it sits at 1.5 million, which is sort of our general annual provision. And then we look at year end to see what sort of projects are in place or if new projects have since emerged that need to be incorporated. The key message to hear is if this water management capital budget increases, which it likely will, it does not impact levy. We have a water capital reserve which we use to uh, fund the ebbs and flows. When we spend under budget, we put money into that capital reserve. When we have to increase the budget, we go to that reserve to fund it so that we don't have to go back to municipalities and ask for additional levy to fund these projects. And most of these are cost shared 50-50 with the provincial government as well. The conservation areas right now, uh, about $2 million in there. That does include a little bit of some of an estimate of the a big project related to our Brant uh, workshop that's been incorporated there to some degree, but is subject to uh, subject to revision based on finalized project spending. 
And our special projects, the message here is that we do not rely on municipal general levy to fund these special projects. The major one being the source protection program and our rural water quality program. And a little bit right now it's species at risk, but by year end, this list will grow. Uh, we will add whatever we still have to spend on floodplain mapping projects. Uh, it's one of the big one, ecological restoration. Uh, I think those are in some trails and wastewater optimization, and they'll be incorporated into the, the future drafts. And this chart just serves to highlight the breakdown of our overall funding sources and to highlight that levy is at about 39%. And this will drop as those other expenses increase. This will be, I typically tell people where about at least one third of our funding comes from municipal levy, and about half our funding is self generated. So the impact of the current draft budget is that the levy request that has been built into here to have a break-even budget is 3.5%. And that increase over the past few years of about 2.5% has been driven by the fact that we have um, greater pressure on our wages and benefit costs and significantly increased insurance premiums to contend with. And this final slide is a slide that uh, we like to present to give some perspective in terms of what we ask for general levy as a uh, cost per capita in the watershed, which is over a million people. And it translates to about $11.47 per capita. Before you go, can you go back a slide? Should that not have been 2023 at a 3.5? Yes. Thank you. So you'll correct that, of course. Thank you. So that ends, Mr. Chairman, my formal presentation. And I think the next steps are just to seek some discussion like this on the levy, et cetera, and question. Sure. Thanks, Sonny. Just before we go, Karen has something. Uh, yes, through you, Chair White. Sorry, I did want to highlight that um, Joan Gatward identified that there actually was an error in the dates of the report on page page 15 of the agenda package uh, in terms of the budget 2023 timetable uh, similar to that date error we also um, the presentations to municipal councils will be November 2022 to February 2023 so I just wanted to make that correction thank you okay uh, comments questions from the floor or board John So uh, I, I, my first question of uh, of the team is around the uh, the engineering role, and my assumption is that at some point uh, it will be funded through transition reserve, like the other role uh, that you identified is. Well, actually, over over time it'll be funded over the operating budget. But is there an opportunity to to make uh, the transition reserve uh, part of the consideration on an interim basis, or is there is there just not enough money in it at this point? I can speak to that, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, there may be some opportunity to use that transition reserve. We'll look at it each year. It's quite healthy and see what other pressures are on it. And um, it would be on the list of options to help with as well. Okay, because it just, that might provide, you know, some relief from, from essentially capital reserves, uh, which you note in your, in your uh, uh, report to us are declining by almost a million dollars this year, correct, roughly? I believe that's what was said. Yes, correct. Uh, without getting specific, uh, is there any upside in land sales in 2023? Are we just being conservative or is there an opportunity to, uh, to put uh, cash into reserves through land sale in 2023? Through you, Mr. Chair. We do actually have a large land sale that will probably come to completion either in the next few months or the beginning of 2023, which is quite a substantial um, addition to the reserves. We also as well um, have a few other properties that we'll be looking to um, sell as well from the residential tenancy program in 2023. Yeah, and I, I acknowledge that will impact a portion of the operating budget. There's probably a greater benefit though, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, Investment income. I'm also assuming that we're being kind of conservative in that regard, knowing where interest rates are going. Correct. Uh, that's correct. And 
again, most of the interest income we earn is going into our reserves. So we, it's part of our reserves. There is some surplus cash. Then I think I've been conservative too in the estimate that falls to our bottom line. And um, I might do a revision or leave it as conservative. And then our forecast adjustments would show maybe some extra interest coming in during next year. Okay, those are my questions, thanks. Thank you, sir. Richard? Yes, thank you. Uh, um, am I to understand that conservation reserve balance is at $2 million then as according to your report? Uh, oh. Excuse me, could you repeat that question? The conservation, the conservation reserve it? account, is it at 2 million? Is that the balance? Mm -hmm. Maybe it'd be better if I think, you- I think provide... it's higher. That's why I want to check my okay. notes. So okay, could, could you just provide the board members with a copy of all our reserves and the balances, please? Thank you. Excuse me, through you, Mr. Chair. There's actually two lines in the budget package. I'm not sure which version people have. Up. Mine is page 16. There's a large chart. And this one, I didn't consolidate the, it's really one conservation area reserve. You can combine the two, we use them interchangeably. And it's more like uh, 4 million, over $4 million. You can look at those two lines combined in terms of what the conservation areas have to work with. We like to think that some of it is sort of kept for stabilization in case revenue forecasts aren't achieved, but um, it's it's available for both. Okay, so that's that's the only reserve we have is those two. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, I didn't hear the second. Sorry. Sorry. So is that the only reserves we have is those two that you mentioned? To use for the conservation areas, correct. Unless there are discretionary reserves, there's a capital, general capital reserve that we've typically thought of more for the water management program. But these were these reserves, there can be discussions by the board to make decisions about maybe moving them. Okay, I'm just wondering then if I couldn't get a copy of the all the reserves we have in the balances. Thank you. Uh, Karen's got a comment. Go, go ahead. Through you, Chair White, um, uh, we annually we do a reserve report at the November meeting. So we will be coming back next month with a report about the reserves balances and the, the details about the reserves. Yeah, that works for me. Okay, thank you. Joan? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, Sonia, near the beginning of your presentation, um, you stated that there was a 4% increase in staff costs and um, 100,000 for an IT person, homers for students. What is the actual proposed increase uh, for 2023 as a salary increase for staff? Through you, Mr. Chair, that has yet to be determined. So that uh, for union, it has to be negotiated through the collective agreement. For non-union, we usually come to the board in November or December uh, to propose a rate increase. And of course, at that point, they will look at uh, what flexibility the budget may have and come to a determination. So that's to be determined. Okay, thank you. And the, the OMERS for students, that is surprising. Um, if, if they opt in, then GRCA has to match whatever they pay in. But if they leave and never come back forever, do they still get that matching funding or how does that work? Through you, Mr. Chair, I do not believe we do not get back whatever we've contributed to them. And I'm not really completely conversant on the OMERS rules on what that happens uh, for the students directly. Uh, I, I, I'll venture a guess. Uh, uh, sorry? I venture a guess. I assume that if the student makes $100 in OMERS and we match $100, it goes to OMERS. And if the student quits, it sits with OMERS till they're 55 or, or whatever it is. So whatever we, it's no different than CPP or you, once it's paid out, it'll go into the OMERS kitty. Um, yeah, it's an interesting little twist, isn't it? Yeah. So if the guy's only, if, if somebody's working for three months, you get three months worth of OMERS, they get, they pay, GRCA will pay their portion. That money will go to OMERS and then it's up to OMERS to determine how that's paid out. I suppose if they came back in five years, then they could bridge. Reboot. Yeah. Thank you. 
I would think. Sue? Uh, thank you. Um, just to respond to that, they can rotate, they can shift it into another RSP for themselves, but they can't really collect it. But it's once it's paid to them, it's no longer owned by them. Um, the question I was going to ask is in your pie chart, you had other municipalities. It was a small wedge, but what, what would that entail? Through you, Mr. Chair, that basically represents the um, rural water quality uh, grants we get for from municipalities. Okay. If there's nothing further from the, oh yeah, go ahead, Kevin. See ya. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank staff very much for the work done in uh, presenting us and providing us with this hybrid meeting format, you might recall was something I'd push for. I realize and appreciate the amount of work that goes into that. And uh, so I made sure I was here today to take advantage of the in-person. Um, I also had some questions for you, through you, Mr. Chair, to Karen, but uh, I understand we'll receive the balance, the um, reserve uh, report next month, and I'm particularly interested in that. But I have two questions, uh, Mr. Chair, that relate to the capital budget, and it's not so much what's in here, but what's not in here, and so I guess it's somewhat relevant. But the first question I have is about the fish ladder at the Caledonia Dam, which um, is in serious need of repair. I don't see it in the capital budget. Uh, is it is it planned in the, the next five years? We don't know what you um, Through you, Mr. Chair. So we actually have been in conversations um, with Six Nations as well as the municipality regarding um, the fish ladder and options for it. Um, so we haven't had those conversations yet. We've been meaning to have the meetings, but um, with staffing changes on our end and as well as Six Nations, we haven't been able to have that first meeting yet. So, but it's on our radar. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to hear that because that, that fish ladder is not working. The migrating fish have to jump the dam. and. Um, so it has an impact that way. The other question I have, Mr. Chair, is um, through my work with the Grand Bridge Energy Board, I know that we're gonna be facing a severe electricity shortage here in Ontario in the next five to 10 years. And uh, they'll be looking for potential sources for hydro generation. When was the last time we looked at the, in our capital budget at um, it, using the dams uh, for a hydro generating station? For stations. Through you, Mr. Chair. So I'll start and I'll probably ask Joe Farwell to hop in. Um, our last project was at Park Hill, which when uh, the transition in the government, we were um, served a cease and desist letter in terms of um, developing uh, that area. But I'll ask Joe to just come up and speak a bit further to that. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we did do a full study of the Park Hill Dam Hydro Project, and we actually took it to initiate the environmental assessment for the project. The province actually terminated through the IESO, the Independent Electric Service Operator, our contract and advised us to stop all proceedings on that project. While we had it started, they refunded the 400000 we had already put into the environmental assessment. But... Um, if there's an opportunity that project could be restarted, uh, you have to look hard at the economics of it. It would take that um, extreme kind of pricing. I think we had it in around 22 cents a kilowatt hour to actually make it financially viable uh, because costs have really skyrocketed for hydro development and things. But uh, we could go, if the price was right, you could probably revive that project. Uh, right now, we were issued a stop work order on that one, essentially, and a commitment to not restart it as part of getting our environmental assessment um, costs back. So that was the main one. We have looked at the other dams, um, and Park Hill was the one that was by far and away the most feasible. Is it, is it? Okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Okay. Thank you, sir. A couple of curveballs there for you, Joe. 
Uh, Bruce, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question on uh, salaries. Uh, is it likely there will be retroactive uh, pay required when negotiations are complete? And is that budgeted for, or is there some from the 2022 budget that's sitting in a reserve? There is somewhat in the 2022 budget that was built in, and but there could be, depending on negotiations, a retroactive element to this that might impact the 2023 budget. But <laughs> yeah. we, we don't know yet. Okay, good. Catherine? Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on the uh, Park Hill Hydro Dam uh, project that was stopped by the government. If you'll recall, when the incoming provincial government came in, they cancelled the Green Energy Act and struck down every every uh, every project that was uh, potentially going to be helpful for communities such as our Park Hill Hydro Dam. My suspicion is that now they've been in government and entering their fifth year. Um, they are going to have to come to recognize that the policy that um, struck down some of these projects is going to have to be uh, looked at again and revived potentially. I will remind people that um, MPP Jess Dixon from Kitchener South Hespler is a um, is a parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Energy and uh, would probably be a good person to reach out to, to sort of follow along to see if there's going to be changes made by the provincial government in order to address the issues of the electricity shortage in the future. Uh, Mayor Davis is correct, uh, uh, Mayor Fox and myself and um, uh, Mayor Davis have been um, looking <clears throat> through our new organization at, <coughs> pardon me, the potential in the future um, for electricity shortage. So I would, <coughs> pardon me, I would say this is a time to reach out, to uh, try and initiate those conversations, um, maybe through uh, MPP Dixon on what the strategy of the province is gonna be in the future. Something's gonna have to be done uh, very quickly. I think it was a naive government that um, entered into um, 2018, uh, really just trying to overturn everything that the previous government has done. And I think regrettably, this, uh, the Park Hill Dam <clears throat> solution to um, generating new electricity was uh, a victim of that. So now's the time for this organization and uh, our collective voices to our provincial representatives to try and uh, revisit a lot of these uh, generation mm -hmm. ideas. Thanks. Okay, so budget related, hopefully. Uh, well, it's about this, but um, we, Grand Bridge is very interested in uh, trying to find new ways to create energy. And so I think um, we could work together but we also have to balance out whether this is the time to move forward with a project like this financially based upon your budget and upon the um, fluctuations within uh, our society and government. So um, I think we should type talks, but I think once we know figures, whether it's prudent to do it now or to defer until hopefully someday things will stabilize a little better, but that's to come once we have more information. Thank you, Sue. Jane? Oh, I was just going to say that uh, with all the work we put into that and the fact that it's it's hydropower, um, I think when everything was canceled, they weren't thinking that this project that is actually a dam, and I know a number of conservatives that I talked to were very surprised that we stopped a hydro project. So I, th I think it is good to move forward. We I don't know if we gave, like there's investigations needed. Did we give all the the money that people donated back to them, what happened with that? Is it still, you know, somewhere being being kept? 
but certainly I think that that is the money that would be generated is is fantastic and would almost run the GRCA. So I think it's worth a look. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Catherine, I'm sorry, did you have something further or is that a legacy hand? Both? Uh, uh. Sorry, legacy hand, but oh, thank uh, you. I, would okay. just, I would just really concur with uh, Mayor Foxen's uh, comments as well. Okay. Thank you. Is there any further comments from the board, comments or questions? I get everybody. Okay. We have a motion that um, report number GM 10 81 budget 2023 draft number one be received as information. Moved by Brian, seconded by John. Uh, all in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. And moving along to 12.2 general municipal levy apportionment. Who wants to talk to this or is this for information? Go ahead. Uh, through you, Chair White, this is just the apportionment okay. based on the draft budget. Okay. All right. I'll read the motion and we'll see if there's anything. Uh, a motion that report number GM 10 2022 80 budget. 2023 draft number one, general municipal levy apportionment be received as information. Can I get a mover for that, please? Move by Sue, second by Brian. Comments, questions? All in favor? That is carried. Is that me echoing? Is that all right? We can live with that. Okay, moving along to uh, cash and investment status. And uh, there was an attachment provided to the addendum. Motion that report number GM 10 77 cash and investment status, September 2022 be received as information. Moved by Jane, seconded by Bernie. Comments, questions? All in favor? That is carried, thank you. Financial summary, motion that the financial summary for the period ending September 30, 2022 be approved. I'll put it on the floor, moved by Less seconded by Kathy. Comments, questions? All in favor? Carried, thank you. Brant Shop Construction Award. Motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority award the tender for the Brant Shop Construction to PK Construction of Tilsonburg, Ontario for the amount of $1,382,600 excluding HST and that a total budget of $1,600,000 excluding HST be approved. Can I get a motion? Moved by Joan, seconded by Helen. Comments, questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Environmental contamination. Uh, so motion that report number GM 10 85 environmental contamination update, River Road, Birkin Lane, Brantford, and 810 Clyde Road, Cambridge, be received as information. Report for information moved by Brian, seconded by Kevin. Any comments or questions, Bernie? Yes, thank you. I had a question with regard to possible, possible uh, legacy liability towards the municipality. When we took over this property, was it an, on an as is basis? Um, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, to Bernie. Um, sorry, which which property are you referring to? Burkett Lane? The previous dump, municipal dump. Okay. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, the GRCA owns the Burkett Lane property. So there, there isn't a municipal liability attached to that. Thank you. Okay, any further comments or questions? This is on the floor, so all in favor? Oh, sorry, Richard, did you have something? Yes, what are we doing to secure the site to make sure that uh, others uh, may, not, may not use it as a dumping site in the future? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'd ask Beth Brown to come up and answer that. So I was speaking about the river road.
I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yes, uh, the, the River Road site had, I believe, barrels of tar on it. I don't think that was put there at an original landfill site, but can you tell me how we're gonna secure the site, which is very accessible by driving into it off a of River Road. Are we gonna secure that site so it cannot be used as a dump site by uh, uh, indeterminate people? Through you, Mr. Chair, there was a recommendation to put up fencing. Um, however, as we're looking at ice mitigation options, that's something that we may want to reconsider. Um, so it's something I think that we still need to investigate further. Okay, thank you. Just want to make sure I raise it. Okay, um, I'm just gonna, I, I know I call, I'm just gonna call the question one more time, all in favor? That is carried, thank you very much. Development interference with wetlands motion that report number GM 10, 2278 development interference with wetlands and alterations to shorelines and watercourses. Regulations be received as information moved by Joe, seconded by Catherine. Comments, questions? All in favor? Carried, thank you. Dam safety. Okay, so we have a presentation here, Caitlin Lynch. Uh, note the attachments were provided in the addendum. Caitlin, welcome. Turn the floor over to you. Through you, Mr. Chair, thank you. And uh, just bear with me for a moment while I share the right presentation. Thank you everyone for, for giving me some time to, to speak today. I'm Caitlin Lynch, a senior engineer, Water Capital, uh, and I'm going to give a, a hopefully a very brief presentation on um, this project we undertook, the Dam Safety Maturity Matrices, which was an evaluation of our recurrent uh, dam management program. Um, so what is a dam safety maturity matrix? Um, it's a tool that we use to evaluate um, our program for the entire portfolio of dams. Um, and we did this through an internal evaluation process. Joe Farwell um, led and facilitated workshops with a series of workshops with staff um, to complete the evaluation. And uh, we provided a report uh, that Joe has prepared um, in your board package on the results and recommendations for our dam management program. So GRCA owns and operates uh, 27 dams in the watershed. Um, we do have seven major dams, which I've highlighted here in red, um, that are used for both, uh, oh, sorry, thank you, I can stay close, <laughs> um, used for watershed scale uh, flood control, as well as low flow augmentation. Um, and there are also auxiliary benefits to these uh, major dams and reservoirs, including hydro production and recreation. And we have a series of smaller dams as well that are important community features. So there are challenges in our dam management program with um, aging infrastructure and the, uh, the capital uh, works that are needed to study, repair and rehabilitate um, these structures. A large portion of the capital budget is focused on our major dams as these structures do have the highest risk associated with them. GRCA does have an effective uh, dam management program right now, and this includes uh, surveillance, operation and maintenance of the dams, our manuals, emergency preparedness plans, dam safety reviews, and the supporting information um, and documentation for the dam portfolio. The success of this program does rely on our staff, their knowledge and continued education and training. Um, our, our dam management program does benefit from our dam operators on site. Uh, at our major dams, they are on site doing inspections daily and the operations are made in person. Um, engineering staff uh, internally complete the inspections of the dams and um, maintenance staff are well-versed in the operation maintenance uh, and different components of all these structures. 
So this is what, uh, what the results of our evaluation look at. Um, we reviewed a series of elements uh, and I've put them up on the screen here. And each um, of these elements really drilled down into further sub elements to get into a lot of detail of the different components of our dam um, management program. And we looked at our whole portfolio of dams as we went through uh, just to highlight some of the elements that we looked at, uh, including dam surveillance, our flow control equipment like the gates and valves, uh, our reservoir operations, public safety, emergency preparedness and response, uh, maintenance of the structures, and training, education, and confidence, and information management. Um, so up here is the overall results. Um, we did uh, um, a lot of our uh, elements did rank at a good industry practice. Um, there are specific metrics that we looked at uh, for each sub element to give it a maturity level. Um, and when we did the, the reason for doing this was to identify uh, program strengths as well as areas for improvement. And it was also a very good framework for staff to share information about our dam management program and to learn about the program. And also it's an effective tool to communicate um, to senior management and stakeholders our program strengths and uh, perhaps areas for improvement. Um, and as I mentioned, we did this with staff, the dam operations staff, uh, engineering staff, uh, dam operators, uh, communication staff, and uh, senior management. Um, so the overall results are an average of all the sub elements. Um, and uh, as you can see, a lot of our, our maturity levels were within good industry practice, which is a good uh, place to be. Some of the sub elements um, did reflect significant effort that we have put into certain areas and uh, in the sub elements were uh, best industry practice, which is, it is a hard uh, target to achieve and it, it uh, requires significant resourcing and investment. And it's really hard to improve on best industry practice. So just a, a brief highlight of the results. And uh, GRCA has put a lot of effort into uh, reservoir operations and public safety, and that's been reflected in the maturity, higher maturity levels and uh, some best industry practice uh, rankings uh, for some of those elements. Uh, we have focused uh, in these areas due to our responsibilities as dam owners, as well as responsibilities for flood forecasting and warning in the watershed. So we have robust programs in place to support the reservoir operations, including our monitoring network, uh, models and mapping, uh, and for public safety, uh, we've uh, invested significant effort into education, and we have our signage and booms and buoys in place at the dams. Um, so these two areas have received significant attention and uh, appropriate levels of funding support. So the recommendations in the report do look to address gaps um, and plan for continued training for staff and knowledge transfer and succession planning. We have had a number of uh, retirements of key staff in both the operations and engineering departments. Um, and these uh, staff had significant experience in the dam management program. So it's resulted in how we have evaluated these sections um, and identified some, some needs. Uh, areas with identified needs to improve include training and education, knowledge transfer, documentation, uh, addressing aging infrastructure, uh, including resourcing needs uh, to continue to plan and implement capital repair works um, and engagement and reporting to senior staff and the board. So, thank, you. thank you very much. Great report, lots in there. Um, any questions or comments from the, uh, Kevin? I beat you to it. Stop sharing. <laughs> Go ahead, Kevin, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So my experience in Brantford with our wastewater treatment plant and our water treatment plant is, you may have noticed that our wastewater treatment plant got the gold star last year. Uh, and that was due in part to the GRCA encouraging uh, the 29 water treatment operators in the watershed to inspiring them to excellence and, and rating them on that basis. And that really has inspired our wastewater treatment staff, our water 
uh, drinking water treatment staff, they really, their objective is to be excellent, not just meet industry practices. So I'm wondering for this department, what is the vision for this department? I mean, it's great that we're meeting the good uh, industry practices, we're meeting that, and that gives me some confidence. But are we trying to inspire the department, the organization that, look, we don't want to be just good. We want to, we want to be excellent. We want to attain the best industry practice, given how important dams are to the river and the protecting uh, the million people that live in the watershed and managing the water. And also, of course, those that draw their uh, drinking water from the river and maintain flows. So what's what is the vision for this department? Yes. Beyond meeting those, uh, obviously some things that need to be done to address some gaps. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's a level of detail that I didn't get into either in the report or the presentation. Um, along with um, assigning a, an existing maturity level, we did create targets, target levels. Um, and as I, I briefly mentioned, uh, best industry practice for some areas, uh, well, for all areas, does in, in, um, it does require significant investment resourcing uh, needs. We have identified certain areas where we are currently best industry practice and we would like to continue to be best industry practice. And this includes items around public safety, um, as well as our reservoir operations, uh, our modeling and flood forecasting. Um, so we, we have targeted certain small elements to, to achieve best industry standards. However, across the board, um, there would have to be a significant reason to justify uh, targeting an increase to best industry practice. Um, what we have identified is um, the priorities and the, the areas where we know that we need to focus. Um, I think I'll leave it at that unless Joe wants to. Yeah, and I think there's been a concerted effort for outreach on this, right? We've had it up at our municipality. It takes two to tango, but at the end of the day, I think that they promote the program very well. And I think if you take a look at it, you see the, the real benefits. So, but we hear what you're saying, and uh, certainly that's something that we're looking at as they move forward. Thank you. Uh, Ian? Uh, thank you, Chair White. Uh, through you. Um, Caitlin, thank you very much for the fulsome report. I have five questions, comments related to Joe Farwell's October 6th report related to the dam management system. Uh, my first question is related to understanding the dam system. I sense concern with the current limited level of understanding of the depth and breadth of the dam management system. May I suggest setting specific targets, dates for expected levels of competency in developing that understanding. Uh, the use of the term ongoing does not encourage that sense of urgency. Uh, my second uh, question comment is related to reservoir operations. What do you mean sorry, by updating? Wait, sorry? Maybe want to, this will be a lot to try to answer all five at the same time. Do you want to comment at all, Joe, or is this for future? Well, let's give, a, give, me, give him a mic here. Sorry, Ian, but just sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can comment as as a member asks the questions. So, are you able to repeat the first question part of that, or was that a uh, recommendation? Certainly, I'm just um, suggesting would it be possible to set specific target dates for expected levels of competency in, in developing that understanding of the dam management system, as opposed to just identifying it as ongoing? Uh, certainly we can suggest target dates. Um, what we tried to convey with the ongoing piece on that was that ongoing training is gonna have to be a real important part of, um, of transitioning some of our new staff. We, we were losing, between Gus, Dwight and I, about 105 years of dam experience over a really short period of time. And we wanna make sure it's ingrained in the organization. When we say ongoing, it's something we're doing, but we wanna make sure it's something that continues into the future. Okay, I just, yeah, the concern about losing all that expertise and experience, um, how do you 
quickly get that into the people replacing you. That's just my concern. Okay. Um, my second question was related to number four, reservoir operations. Uh, what do you mean by updating the GOS or GRIFS program? Are you considering a newer version of the software or its replacement with a competitor? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we're looking at replacement of a competitor. We have um, a software program that's been developed specifically for the grant. Uh, we've been working with the Hydrologic Engineering Center in the States, which is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, to actually bring the kind of software they use, and we would like to upgrade so that it's a, a more standardized platform rather than a than a than a one-off like we have right now. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it makes it easier for new people to learn it as opposed to relying on uh, senior staff who remember how to program it. You're absolutely right. And it's actually much easier to maintain and, and carry on with upgrades as they're released by, um, by the software companies. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my next question is related to number five, public safety. Are you considering signage at river access points down river of the dams to warn the public about sudden releases of water? We haven't contemplated that. Can we come back to that question, like evaluate it within our organization and then come back with a response to that? We haven't yes. typically done that. Uh, it's right below the large dams. What happens with a large discharge typically is it dissipates. So by the time you get, uh, you know, two feet or you might have a two foot rise right below the dam and certainly there's warnings there. But um, by the time it works its way downstream, it's relatively small, but let us, let us, uh, contemplate that one. I'm just thinking, say, below Lake Bellwood, you have fishermen in the water, would they recognize what that um, warning signal sounds when you're opening the dam gates? If there would be anything that warns them about that? Certainly the, the horn is sounded and we can, we can work on making sure there's an ongoing communication plan to, to warn people and make sure they understand what it means. Okay. My next question was related to number six, emergency preparedness and response. Are you considering tying in with the province's Amber Alert program as is used for tornado warnings to warn of a emergency release? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we haven't contemplated that. We can investigate it and see if it's something that they actually um, would contemplate with that, but um, I don't have an answer to that one now, but we, because it's a, a new thought, but we can, we can follow it up. Yeah. I'm just thinking a lot of us carry cell phones and that's one way to get the message out very quickly. Uh, my final uh, question was related to training, education and competence number 10. Are you considering tying training programs to performance management and compensation to meet your training goals? Uh, we haven't traditionally done that, but we actually do want to make sure we get an appropriate training program in place for our staff. Um, we do work with a number of other groups and uh, through the Canadian Dam Association, we attend a lot of conferences. We haven't actually contemplated how to put it into performance management, uh, although we do actually make it a requirement that we, we train our staff. So uh, we haven't tied it to uh, compensation, but... Um, you know, we can consider that. We certainly tie it to uh, promotions and assigning, assigning uh, more senior roles within the program. Now, I'm just looking at it as a way to incentivize um, getting that training that you need to happen, happen as quickly as possible. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, is there anybody else comments, questions? I'll put the motion on the floor. I don't believe I have. Motion that report number GM 102279 dam safety maturity matrices evaluation of the GRCA's dam safety program be received as information moved by John, seconded by Joan. Uh, anything? Do you have a question? Oh, all in favor? You're being speedy on me, Warren. That is carried. Thank you very much. So I'll put the current watershed motion on the floor. Motion that report number GM 102282, current watershed conditions as of October 19th, 2022 be received for information. Moved by John, seconded by Bruce Banbury. Are there any comments or questions on that? Uh, all in favor? That is carried, thank you very much. Oh, what do we got coming up here? Nothing 30, 40, 50, 60 more. And 
Welcome, sir. <laughs> I will uh, turn the floor over to you and uh, we'll see what you have for us today. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be back in the horseshoe. I have never been in an elected position, so I have never sat in the official horseshoe, horseshoes around the council chambers, but to be part of this organization uh, for the last 12 years has been, or last 10 years, no, 12 years, I guess has been very, very exciting for me. Uh, this is my last meeting. I'm uh, going to, uh, I've said it, attended my resignation with the region of Waterloo uh, as their lay representative or one of the lay representatives. And I just want to say that it's been a pleasure for 52 years that I've been involved with the GRCA, first as a teacher in 1969 at Eastwood Collegiate, then Galt Collegiate, back to Eastwood and retiring in 1999 from Amira District. This organization has been the, the, the support of the teachers in the, in the classroom. Our grade 11 physical geography class that you may or may not have taken, and which everybody should take, um, the organization allowed me to, to teach about the watershed in that grade 11 physical geography course. Even today, some 40, 50 years later, I will see former students and they'll say, remember that field trip to Rockwood Conservation Area when we went spelunking in the caves? or the drumlins at Westover, or in the Guelph area. But it was such an important part for their life and for me as a teacher. So I really do thank people like Jim Bauer, Matt Coots, George Stormont, Ralph Beaumont, who were here in the early days and now have gone on to retirement and, uh, and other things. Um, I think this organization is really well run. I've seen the leadership over the years and it's been well done. The board members who represent you, the various watershed communities have done a great job. They've been engaged as we see in our questions that, they, that people have been asking. Uh, this has been going ongoing and that kind of thing. So congratulations to all of you who have participated as, as a member of the board of the GRCA. It's a, a great, I mean, I've been thrilled. I, my wife will say, you must have had a good meeting. You're in a good mood. Um, I wish you the best of the uh, success for the future. I will always continue to be a supporter of the GRCA uh, through my shunt biking tours um, up and down the watershed of the Grand. So you may see me in Dunville. You may see me in Dundalk on, on a bus tour. If you do, say hello. Uh, it's been, and people love it. I was out yesterday doing a Mennonite tour in the Waterloo region. People from Cambridge had no idea about what's happening in Wellesley and in Woolwich Township with the Mennonites. In fact, this young man, the mayor of Wellesley, actually met a group, a walking tour group in downtown Wellesley one day. And as a result of Joe interacting with them, he, she said, I'm going home to tell my husband we're moving to Wells Lake. <clears throat> right. So uh, congratulations, everybody. I think it's been um, a great year for me and I've had fun. And if we're all having fun, we're having a wonderful life. Thank you very much for the opportunity to bring other business to you. Well, Warren, clearly you'll be sorely missed. We know you'll still be out there supporting us and we do appreciate all the stuff that you've brought to the GRCA over the years, but now we can strike other business from the agenda. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you, sir. Catherine, hard act to follow, but to give it a shot. Yeah, I will say thank you to Warren and, and what a, uh, a wonderful representative he's been over so many years and so much enthusiasm. I also wanted to thank this organization for many years of uh, stellar leadership and stewardship of our Grand River watershed. And I'd also say that um, GRCA is recognized not just in the uh, conservation authorities in Ontario, but really this is an organization whose work and creativity and innovation has actually resonated across the country and indeed internationally. Um, past leadership, current leadership has been stellar. 
I couldn't have been more proud to work on and deliver a modernization of the Conservation Authorities Act in uh, 2017 as Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. And of course, it was no surprise to anybody here that I leaned very heavily as Minister on the GRCA in order to help craft, I think, what was a stellar piece of legislation in 2017. I have um, many fond memories and have had many discussions with uh, upper leadership here. Um, the GRCA was even, of course, the backdrop to the provincial launch of the legislation and uh, how how fitting it was that we were at the headquarters here and <clears throat> off of Clyde Road and even the red canoe that uh, happened to sort of go past as the cameras were rolling uh, just at the precise moment. It really was a stellar piece of legislation really helped um, by the GRCA. Having sat um, as mayor for the last four years on this organization through a very tumultuous time both in energy policy, conservation authority, the stripping out and changing of, um, I think, measures that uh, really help the stewardship of the land, but also was and is incredibly important for climate change mitigation, for uh, education, for our residents along the watershed on how important wetlands are, biodiversity, uh, clean water systems, um, uh, control of uh, erosion and, and flood control. This organization is uh, incredibly important to all. I certainly recognize it. I am saddened personally by some of the changes that are being proposed. I think as mayor of the city, we have benefited tremendously and will continue to benefit from the recreation lands and from all the work that GRCA is doing. I want to say thank you to everyone on this organization for the opportunity for me to sit on the board in the last four years. This is my last meeting as well. And I just want to say best of luck in the future. I will be uh, following along with the work you're doing. I think um, we have set up the organization as best we can under challenging provincial legislation circumstances. And I couldn't be more proud of each and every one of you. It's been an absolute honor and privilege to be not only your minister, but also uh, sit on the board of directors. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, appreciate that. Jane. Yes, I just wanted to uh, thank Warren and Catherine for their work on the GRCA. Uh, they've really, particularly Catherine, has done so much for conservation over the years. I'm, I'm very sorry that you lost your election. And Warren, you have done so much for conservation and for the environment over the years, right back to when we were on the, I was on the school board and we were on the environmental committee and you came in with baguette, which was a big garbage bag to show us what we could do with recycling. So uh, thank you both for your sterling work. And uh, I'm sure we haven't seen the last of either of you. Thank you. Uh, Les? Well, <clears throat> it is a day of last, I guess. Um, this is my last uh, meeting as well. Um, I wanna thank the board for the uh, opportunity to be here and represent Wilmot Township. And I wanna thank the board for educating me so that I can educate the people of Wilmot and of the region of Waterloo as well because of the tremendous work that the board has done in the past and, and I know we'll do in the future. So I just want to tell everybody to keep up the good work because you're all doing a damn fine job on several occasions and several locations. And uh, please continue and everyone who is staying Congratulations, and those who are not staying, congratulations as well. Enjoy the time <laughs> off. Take care. Covered all those bases. Uh, Sue? Uh, thank you, and through the chair. Warren, what a great experience it's been to work with you. You're an amazing individual and how blessed we are to have had you. And to those that are leaving, the bad news is I'm not, um, but uh, 
I wish you all the best. Less, I'm going to miss you. Less isms. <laughs> he has a, a unique way of saying things. And uh, will there be a time that we will be getting together one last time to deal with the goodbyes and whatever? No, this is it. I, this is, I think we're right. Yeah, okay. After which meeting? Depending on how things go and quorum and all the rest of those things, perhaps we could have a little gathering at the end of the meeting in December is the thought. Excellent. Folks want to come back, Excellent. we'll send an invitation out. You bring the food and stuff though, Sue, since you it's your it. idea. You got okay. it. <laughs> okay, right. thank you. All right. Uh, Bernie. Yes, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed being on the board with a lot of very professional and dedicated people. I'd indicated to you earlier that I uh, have given it up, but it's great to have seen a number of you people out on the road when we've been in at conventions, Brian and Sue and a number of people that are met. Enjoyed it, good luck to you. Have a good year. Google it. Okay. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you for those comments and thank you, Warren. And uh, I mean, I, you can echo all of those sentiments and, and we're all on the board. It's, it's an incredible organization. It has great staff. It's well-respected. Got some challenges ahead, but I know that the staff are up for it. And we do appreciate all the time and effort that everybody has, uh, has put into the board. And if we do have a little thing in December, just bring something under $5 each. And we'll, we'll all be good. So hopefully we'll see some of you folks there. If not, we'll see them in downtown Wellesley. Uh, Jane, are you are you back for some more? Oh, yeah. I just, because I missed Les, right? Because he hadn't said anything. So, so just, and of course, Bernie had mentioned, I've mentioned before, but uh, yes, Les, we will miss you. And uh, I will always use some of your expressions, um, like you can't fix stupid <laughs> in my life. So uh, Thank you very much, Les, for uh, for your work on on everything that you've done as mayor and as uh, on the GRCA. Thanks, Jane. All right. If there are no further comments, we'll um, we do have a one one final item on here, which is a potential closed meeting. Now, this is the minutes of the last meeting. So, unless there's any questions, we don't need to go into close. We can just approve. So, if there's no questions on the last closed session, I have a motion that the minutes of the previous closed session be approved as circulated. Moved by John, seconded by Sue. This is your last hurrah, all in favor? That is carried, thank you very much. And um, all right, folks, well, it's been a pleasure. We'll, we'll see what happens for every, the rest of the folks on the 25th, and hopefully we'll see some of you in December for the rest of you. Thanks again, and we'll, we'll see you around. Thank you. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Who wants that one? Guy Guardhouse has decided to step up. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And two, do I need two? two? And Brian. Brian, thank you, sir. The meeting is officially adjourned. Thank you very much. So now the magic ends. Nice hat. Nice. <laughs> it's, it's another.